When we think of a tree, what comes to mind? Is it its leaves, its branches, its roots? Maybe we think about the life that resides within it, above it, below it. Squirrels, bats, pigeons, worms, fungi, moss. Okay, when we think of a tree, do we think of a violin, or a clarinet, a grand piano? What about a guitar? These things, whilst different, are all intrinsically the same, aren't they? They're all just chopped up pieces of different trees. But why don't we see them in this way? Up until 2019, I worked in the music retail industry, selling grand pianos and guitars for a little over a decade. So today's talk will revolve around my understanding of nature and its value through something that I'm very familiar with. This is my guitar. I can tell you that this guitar has a Sitka spruce top, has rosewood back and sides, has an ebony fingerboard and bridge, and a mahogany neck. And I've rambled on for thousands of hours in my career about the different comparative benefits between these woods and others, but I've never really thought about the implications behind this fascination until recently. North American Sitka spruce, East Indian rosewood, Madagascan ebony, African mahogany, four different countries, four different trees for one guitar manufactured here in the UK. Capitalism assigned these trees a predetermined economic value. And whilst globalized capitalism has afforded us the diversity of guitar brands we see across the world today, as consumers and enthusiasts, we're often left alienated from the natural origin of these instruments. So this is the problematic notion of economic value that has become attached to nature. And it's going to be the central issue of today's talk. Before my academic exposure to the climate crisis, in October of 2019, my partner and I bought one-way tickets to Australia. And we probably couldn't have gone at a worse time, really. Um, <laughs> global pandemic aside, um, our eyes were open to the realities of climate change through the wildfires that were sweeping the countryside in January of 2020. It's the kind of environmental destruction you may only see once in your life living in the global north. But it does remain the harsh reality for billions living across the globe. So on my return back to the UK, I went back into education to further understand the climate crisis. I wanted to know the why behind the how. How did we end up with a man-made climate crisis given all that we know and have known for decades? I didn't want to do this philosophically. Well, I did want to do this philosophically. I didn't want to do this scientifically or geologically or environmentally. I wanted to do it philosophically. But this path led me deeper than I could have ever imagined. And as it turns out, the degradation of nature's moral standing has been a constant theme in the Western philosophical tradition for close to 500 years. But its influence is stretched back far further than that. So to really oversimplify things in the interests of time, let me quickly walk you through the ideas that have shaped and changed our history and have led us to the man-made climate crisis we call the Anthropocene. The actions taken by those in the global north are made through what can be called a Eurocentric paradigm or worldview. Now, this paradigm holds that there is a moral distinction between humans and the natural world. This paradigm reinforces ideas and actions which modern science is telling us are directly harming the planet. And this paradigm has its roots all the way back to ancient Greece. But we start with Aristotle. Now, Aristotle had a hierarchy of being where he placed humans at the top, animals in the middle, and plant life at the base. We move forward quite some time, and we reach Francis Bacon and René Descartes, who both extolled the virtues of dominating and exploiting nature for its material worth. We move forward again, and we reach Immanuel Kant. Now, he codified and altered the moral standing of nature forever by putting humans above the natural world. Even outside of this philosophical arena, we see Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, who all claimed that the rise of man would be through the uh, possession of such virtues as consciousness, sentience, rationality, civility, culture, with those people who possessed these qualities being able to dominate those who were uncultured, savage, barbaric, wild, closer to nature. To exploit the economic value from nature became the resounding mission for much of European colonialism. Any intrinsic value that nature might have possessed until this point was quashed in favor of an economic value. The Eurocentric paradigm must be understood to have the following distinction. Consumers 
are morally different than the consumed. Politically motivated economic decisions have destroyed biodiverse hotspots across the globe. But these decisions have not only affected natural surroundings, they have affected the lives of indigenous communities and First Nation peoples across the world. Ironically, had we just recognized the intrinsic worth of nature to begin with, we might actually save ourselves a lot of money. <laughs> trees absorb carbon, trees improve the soil quality, and trees improve the water quality in the land around them. And these services often go unnoticed until they are compromised, and man-made alternatives have to be brought in to fill the gaps. So how do we overcome this Eurocentric paradigm? There have been cultures, practices, and traditions which have sought to reject the economic value ascribed by you know, many years of thought. Romanticism, Gaia theory, deep ecology, veganism. But the one that stands out to me is biocentricity, or biocentrism. Now, biocentrism challenges the Eurocentric paradigm in a number of ways. But the main one is that it rejects the simplistic moral binary between human and nature. And instead, it recognizes the interconnectedness of us all and how we are weaved together rather than kept separate and superior from one another. It speaks about empathy, compassion, and understanding of the wholeness in relation to each other and respect for our collective neighbor and host, Earth. I've had long and deep debates with people who claim it is impossible to strike a balance between environmental and economic sustainability. But the science is clear, isn't it? You know, the evidence is all around us. The wildfires, the floods, the droughts, the pandemics, the natural disasters which are occurring. The time to act is now, really. We must change our ways. The time for incrementalism has passed. We are at a pivotal moment in humanity's existence. Will we continue the destructive ideologies that have perpetuated us throughout history and have led us to a man-made climate crisis? Or will we reimagine our relationship with nature through the ideas of biocentricity? I'd like to leave you all with two questions for today. How can I incorporate biocentric values into my own personal and professional lives? And how can I help shape a future where human progress is no longer measured solely by economic growth, but by how sustainable we be? I hope today has given you a chance and a space to reflect and reimagine your own relationship with nature. But I'll leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs>